second morning session. Dr. Gore has a quick announcement uh, to make before we launch into immunotherapy. Sorry, I, I apologize. I meant to inject a plug into my talk, uh, but you know, as part of this user design, uh, center design process, we try to get input from patients as we go through the development of the tool. And there's a there's a gentleman outside named Sean Miklis at the table right out here, who has a sign up if you're interested in giving us your input on the on the quality of life oh on the quality of life tracker tool. So if you're interested in giving us input in the current state of the tool before we launch in a month, um, Sean Miklis is right outside with the sign up and we'll contact you to schedule an appointment. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move into the second session, which really is a, is a highlight focusing on uh, some of the latest advances in immunotherapy. So how many of you saw the movie Fantastic Voyage many, many years ago? So as a kid, that was probably my first introduction in retrospect to immune therapy. If you remember Raquel Welch. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised, Stan, you don't use that image in your talks. Uh, everybody wanted to be an antibody uh, attacking Raquel Welch at that moment. So anyway, uh, so this session focuses on immunotherapy, and our first speaker is Dr. Mike Schweitzer, who's uh, a medical oncologist that we recruited a little more than a year ago from Johns Hopkins University. You, remember, you may remember his talk last year focusing on testosterone therapy, this bipolar androgen idea which that trial is now open and underway uh, at the University of Washington. Today he's going to give us an introduction on immune therapy. Mike? All right, thanks, Pete. I guess I'm the, the token clinician in a room full of immunologists today. But um, I was going to talk about, I guess, cancer immunotherapy and specifically just go over some immunology 101. Um, this is a very uh, large topic, so I'm going to give sort of a, a, a whirlwind tour of it and hopefully I do it some justice. And then at the end, I was also going to touch on therapeutic cancer vaccines. So I think um, the way I think about the immune system's uh, fundamental job is that it's really there to recognize things that don't belong in our body and to eliminate them. And so oftentimes we think of this as being pathogens, things like bacteria or virally infected cells, but this can also refer to cancer cells. And so I think central to the ability of the immune system to actually recognize uh, something as being foreign and eliminating it is that it has to be able to differentiate between what a normal looking cell looks like and what a cancer cell looks like. So uh, for instance, say we have a normal looking prostate cell here. He's, uh, he's friendly enough. He has uh, normal proteins on his surface. The immune system's uh, matured in his presence so he knows that he's a friend and that when he, has these, when he sees a cell that has uh, proteins that look like this on its surface, these are things that he can leave alone. In this context, we usually refer to these proteins as uh, antigens. There are a lot of ways that the immune system can recognize normal versus foreign appearing cells, but antigen recognition is one of the important ones. So I'm gonna focus on that just for a second because I'll bring it up later on as well. Um, but this normal cell can actually transform usually through some mutation event into an angry form of itself. This is a prostate cancer cell that um, looks distinctly different from the normal prostate cell. So he may actually have some of the same antigens as the cell he was, he was derived from, um, but he probably also has some abnormal antigens on his surface too. And these are uh, abnormal because they were encoded for by this mutated DNA. So they're distinct from the normal cell. And this is one of the ways that the immune system can recognize cells as being normal, cells that they should leave alone versus cells that are from, say, a cancer or another you know, infectious agent. And so uh, when we think about the role that the immune system plays in trying to control cancer, um, this is just one uh, hypothesized way that this, uh, this occurs. And so this is called the immune editing hypothesis. And uh, it basically lays out three phases by which the immune system interacts with, with a cancer. And so on, the, so on the far left, there's the first phase, the elimination phase. This is when the cancer is uh, first developed the uh, tumor cells are represented by the, the green and the blue hexagons. Uh, at this stage, the immune system uh, immediately recognizes it as being the enemy. They rush to its site and they work furiously to try to kill off the tumor cells. Um, if they're not able to completely eliminate the cancer cells, an equilibrium can be struck, whereby it's essentially a stalemate between the tumor cells and the immune system. 
And this can go on for some time. Eventually, if the tumor does progress, though, we call this the escape phase. And this is when the immune system is really no longer effective in controlling the cancer. And uh, this is the phase when we feel like the immune system really has, has failed to do its job appropriately and keep the tumor under control. And so I think one of the central questions of immunotherapies is how do we reverse this process? Can we take cells that have escaped immune surveillance or come up with new strategies to try to get the immune system to re-engage those tumor cells and eliminate them again? And so just to take a step back and talk a little bit about um, immunology basics, um, I did want to briefly touch upon uh, just the two main branches of the immune system. So uh, there are two main branches, the innate and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is just like the name uh, would have you think. It's what you're born with. These are sort of like the first responders to a uh, foreign appearing uh, cell. It's rel relatively rapid, occurs within the, the, a matter of uh, hours to days, but it is uh, short-lived. This isn't the branch of the immune system that results in long-term immunity, and it's also not specific. The immune cells in the innate immune system really react to foreign appearing cells in a more generic way. They recognize general patterns that would have you realize that the cell is abnormal, but it's not going to be specific for one type of cell, for one type of cancer cell or one type of viral cell, et cetera. Um, the adaptive immune system is the other uh, branch of the immune system, and this is relatively uh, slow to respond compared to the innate immune system, usually over the order of a few days. Uh, but this can result in long-lasting immunity, and importantly, it's also relatively specific. So the main cells of the adaptive immune system are T and B cells, and they both have specificity for one or maybe a few antigens, and that allows them to really target just one type of cell that we think needs to be cleared. Um, these two branches are not completely independent of one another. There is some crosstalk between them, and one of the important roles that the innate immune system plays is actually in activating the adaptive immune system. And so I did want to spend just, I guess, one more minute talking about the adaptive immune system because this is sort of, this is the branch of the immune system that most immunotherapies are really geared towards uh, activating. And so, um, again, there are two cell types, T and B cells. Regarding T cells, these are, um, during uh, the first couple decades of life, people generate probably on the order of tens to hundreds of millions of unique T cells. These T cells each have uh, unique receptors on their surface, represented by the, the green here. And these receptors are really specific for, for a single antigen. Um, at this stage, when these T cells are sort of surveilling the, uh, the bloodstream or in the lymphatic system, they're really not activated. They're not able to do what they're intended to do and actually eliminate these foreign appearing cells. They have to become activated, and one of the important ways that these T cells become activated is that they uh, engage with their antigen. And so one of the cells from the innate immune system, or a class of cells, the antigen-presenting cells, it, one of its main jobs is to actually show this T cell the antigen that it's specific for. Once this uh, interaction happens, when the antigen is exposed to the T cell that it was meant to link up with, these cells start to proliferate, and they actually change into a number of different cell types. Um, the, uh, the cytotoxic T cell is probably the one that does most of the work in actually killing off the abnormal appearing cells. Um, but there are a number of other subtypes which um, we can talk about later if people are interested. B cells are, are pretty similar to T cells in regards to the fact that they are rather specific. Um, before they're activated, they, they also have a B cell receptor on their surface. And, uh, the activation of this population of B cells really is uh, predicated on them also engaging with their, their antigen. So in this case, uh, you have a T cell actually showing the B cell its antigen, but once it's exposed to the antigen specific for, uh, these cells will differentiate into a few different cell types. One of them, plasma cells, are sort of like mini factories that make antibodies. And so once these plasma cells have uh, started revving up, they're going to churn out a specific antibody. All these antibodies are identical and they're specific for one antigen. And so you can imagine if you have a cancer cell that has had uh, a B cell uh, you know, respond to its antigen, it's gonna generate all these antibodies which are then gonna go out and bind to any cell that expresses those antigen. They're gonna coat it, and once it's coated with antibodies, it's basically gonna be tagged for destruction and it'll end up getting killed through a number of different varieties, a uh, variety of mechanisms. And so there are a, a lot of immunotherapeutic strategies and we're gonna hear about uh, a few of these later on in separate talks, but I was asked to talk a little bit about cancer vaccines specifically. 
So um, when we talk about cancer vaccines, we're usually referring to therapeutic vaccines. So these are vaccines that are intended to treat cancer, not vaccines that are intended to prevent it. Although there are some vaccines that probably do that as well, like the HPV vaccine, for instance. Um, and most of these cancer vaccines, the way they function is really to expose the immune system to antigens that are on cancer cells to allow the immune system to see that antigen and hopefully generate a response that's gonna result in the immune cells going out and killing off tumor cells that express those antigens. And so there are a number of different strategies. There's viral-based vaccines like Prosvac, VF. There's a dendritic cell vaccines like Provenge or Cipulosal T. There are DNA vaccines and there are other types as well, but I wanted to just touch on these briefly. So I, I know this is a, a complicated figure, but I did wanna just walk through it step by step because I think it um, highlights how a viral-based vaccine works. Uh, and I highlight the Prosvac VF vaccine because there's actually some pretty encouraging data with this vaccine that it can perhaps prolong life. That was shown in a small study, and there's currently a much larger trial, which we, we hope to have a readout on in the next year or so. But it's possible that you might hear more about this drug in the future if that, that larger study comes back positive as well. But the way these viral-based vaccines work is generally that uh, DNA that's in a little loop, we call that plasma DNA, encodes for uh, a couple of different proteins. So it encodes for PSA, which is a prostate antigen, and then encodes for three other proteins, in the case of Prospect VF, which basically work to stimulate the immune system. This little plasmid of DNA is inserted into two different types of viruses, a vaccinia and a foulpox virus. And then these two viruses that are loaded up with this DNA, that's what Prospect VF is. So patients get the Prospect VF, um, this loaded virus basically, and then once it's in their system, it goes on to infect normal cells. So the Prospect VF, uh, this virus that's loaded with this DNA is gonna infect normal epithelial cells. These cells are gonna start making the proteins that are encoded for by the DNA. They're gonna make PSA and they're gonna make these other immune stimulatory proteins. Eventually these cells die, but they're gonna release all those proteins they just made. These proteins then get taken up by these antigen presenting cells and then they take those proteins and they present them to T cells. These T cells then now have met up with the antigen they were destined to, to bind with and they start dividing, turning into cytotoxic T cells and going out and destroying cancer. And so that's generally how a viral based vaccine works and this is specifically for the Prosvac VF. <laughs> The next one I wanted to talk about was uh, Cipulosal T or Provenge because this is actually the, the only uh, therapeutic vaccine that's approved for any cancer right now, at least in the US. And so the way this works is that a patient undergoes what we call leukophoresis, so they actually remove a volume of blood and they spin it off and they harvest just the white blood cells, the immune cells. These uh, immune cells, and specifically the antigen presenting cells, uh, are basically incubated for 36 hours with a protein where half of the protein is PAP, which is an antigen on prostate and prostate cancer cells, and GMCSF, which is a protein that stimulates the immune system. After that 36 hour period, these cells are given back to the patient. Um, and this whole process goes on for a total of three treatments, each spaced out by two weeks. And that entire course is what we consider a, a round of Provenge. Uh, but after these cells are infused, you have these antigen presenting cells that are now primed to basically present this PAP antigen to T cells. And similar to Prospect VF, these T cells uh, become activated and then they go out and kill off tumor cells. One of the, uh, the sort of uh, perplexing things about Provenge, about Cipulosal T, is that in all the studies, it doesn't look like it actually shrinks tumors. It doesn't look like it decreases PSA levels. But the phase three study and even a phase two study showed that it improved overall survival, and that's why it was approved. Um, these two points seem a little bit uh, discordant with one another, but I think there, there may be an explanation for, for how Cipulosal T is able to actually effectively prolong someone's life but not actually lower their PSA or shrink a tumor. And so this is a, a graph that's depicting basically a, a, a tumor's growth over time. So if you, let it, if you do nothing, it's gonna grow and it'll keep growing if you don't intervene at some point. Conversely, if at that same point you were to treat another patient with uh, Provenge, you might actually be able to flatten the rate at which the tumor is growing. So you've changed the kinetics of how fast this tumor is growing. And if you imagine that the two dashed lines represent the lower and upper bound of sort of what type of difference you'd be able to see in the growth of a tumor, 
you actually gain a considerable amount of time between these two scenarios so that the guy who's had his growth kinetics flattened so that the tumors aren't growing as fast will actually have gained a lot of time compared to the person who didn't get cipulosal T. This is a theory. We haven't really proved this in the case of Provenge, but this is one of the explanations for how it might actually result in prolonged survival but not necessarily cause tumors to shrink or PSAs to decline. So uh, Provenge, again, I think it does have uh, some efficacy, and it's certainly appropriate for, for some patients, but I think um, there are, there's definitely opportunities to try to improve upon the efficacy of Provenge. And so this is a clinical trial that we have ongoing uh, here at the SCCA that's looking at taking patients who have been treated with Provenge and then randomizing them 50-50 between either just observation or another drug called IL-7. IL-7 is a protein that naturally occurs in all of us, and it's, one of its main jobs is really to stimulate T cells. So the idea is that if stipulosal T can generate a T cell response, if you follow that up with IL-7, it might make that response that much better, and hopefully that translates into better responses to the drug. Um, the main point of this study is really to look at these T cell responses specifically, and that's what, what we're looking out for. But I think if that looks promising, a future trial would perhaps look to see if this strategy is superior in terms of efficacy to just cipulosal T alone. The, the last type of vaccine that I wanted to talk about was uh, DNA vaccines. And I apologize for this crude schematic. I couldn't find a, a pretty one on the internet, so I kind of patched this one together. Um, but the DNA vaccine, it basically just involves injecting little plasmids of DNA directly into the, the muscle. And so this specific one, INO5150, is one that we're testing here, and it uses uh, two plasmids, actually. One of them encodes for the protein PSA, which, again, is a prostate-specific protein, and the other one encodes for PSMA, which is another protein that's commonly found on prostate and prostate cancers. So these two plasmids are put in a syringe. They're injected into the muscle. Once they're injected, you, we actually use uh, an electroporation device, which gives a small electrical current around the site of the injection. And what that does is it opens up the, the muscle cells so that they can take up this plasmid DNA. And once the muscle cells have taken up this DNA, they're going to start making the proteins that it encodes for. So these muscle cells eventually die, but after being injected with this INO5150, they're going to release a bunch of antigens that are prostate-specific. And just like Prosvac and just like stipulosal T, these antigens are going to be recognized by the immune system. You're going to get T cells that are going to be generated and probably B cell responses too. And so this is just the general schematic for the clinical trial we have going on now looking at this drug. Um, this is specifically for guys who have biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. And what that means is they've gone through some local therapy, like um, had a surgery or had radiation, but their PSA is rising. We don't see any cancer on scans, but because the PSA is going up, we worry that the cancer cells might be lurking around somewhere. And so we take those patients and we treat them with basically escalating doses of this INO5150 vaccine. And then some of the men also get an additional DNA vaccine that encodes for IL-12. IL-12 is another protein that helps to stimulate T cell responses. And so the end point of this study is really looking at safety because this is a very early study and we have to make sure the strategy is safe first. Um, but it's also going to look at some of the T cell and B cell responses to see if there is a signal that this actually works to do what we hope it's doing. So um, I know there was a lot of information all at once, and I'm sure we can talk more about it during the Q&A, but just to summarize, uh, the, the immune system has the ability to recognize cancer cells and to clear it, and there's a lot of evidence supporting that. Um, tumors can undergo a number of adaptive changes that ultimately allow them to circumvent the destruction by immune cells. And then I think on a fundamental level, I think immunotherapies are really seeking to revitalize the anti-tumor immune response, and there are a lot of ways to do this. I talked about vaccines, but I think we'll hear about some other uh, newer methods that are being explored here. So 